Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this miserable day. <laughs> appreciate everyone making the effort. Uh, seems to be deteriorating by the moment out there, so uh, really appreciate. Thankfully, uh, Mayor Chen is here to bring a ray of sunshine uh, into uh, this uh, dismal day here in Washington, and uh, we're very, very pleased to have the opportunity to, to host her. Uh, my job is simply to give a few opening remarks. Uh, just wanted to give people a sense of the background of um, her visit here and uh, this event. Um, we've been working on this for about a year, I, I, I think, um, and the idea started um, with a discussion we had here at CSIS trying to think about um, how we could highlight uh, prominent uh, Asian female leaders. Um, you know, this is an area where, frankly, Taiwan is in the lead, um, and especially the current government is uh, is very much in the lead, and certainly is a development that we would like to see um, happen further. And so I want to also thank our colleague, Beverly Kirk, from our Smart Women, Smart Power program for her assistance in helping us arrange this. Um, Mayor Chun has just completed a, a very interesting podcast with uh, Beverly, and I uh, encourage everyone to please listen to that once it's uh, posted online. Um, I will just very quickly go over the mayor's bio and then we'll get right into it. Um, mayor Chen Zhu currently serves as the mayor of Kaohsiung, Taiwan, and since becoming assistant to a provincial assembly member at 19 years of age in 1969, Madam Chun has played an active political role in Taiwan for nearly half a century and is a big, uh, prominent leader in Taiwan's democratization movement. Immediately following the establishment of the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, in 1986, Madam Chun began serving in several senior positions within the government, including representative of Kaohsiung City, uh, city government in the National Assembly, Director General of the Social Affairs Bureau in Taipei and Kaohsiung City Government, and Minister of the Labor Affairs Council within the Executive UN. She also served in several positions in the Taiwan Association for, for Human Rights, including as Director, Secretary General, and President. In 2006, Madam Chun was elected to mayor her current position and is the longest locally elected government representative currently serving, having served in the role for now 12 years. And under her leadership, Kaohsiung hosted the 2009 World Games and in 2013 was awarded uh, the most prizes by the United Nations Awards for Livable Communities. Uh, the mayor's office has asked us to show a short video, which we'll share with you right now, and then we will welcome her up here for her speech. So uh, please watch the video. Thank you. What do you see when you look at Kaohsiung? Kaohsiung's appearance, Kaohsiung's characteristics, the lifestyle of Kaohsiung's people, and our mutual vision for a glorious future. This is what we mean by Kaohsiung style. We cherish our lives and respect history. We treasure different communities' life experiences and are united by the memories we share. Reverence and sentiment. This is the Kaohsiung style. In a vintage house, brew a cup of tea or coffee, and inhale the fragrance of bygone eras. Along the streets, amidst the alleys, glimpse the old city that stays young. Old city and new life. This is the Kaohsiung style. Interchanging lines delineate the beauty of our city. Every building is a vision for future landscapes and a blueprint for quality lifestyles, creativity, and aspirations. 
This is the Kaohsiung style. An element of our bustling urban lifestyles is to seek new possibilities of movement towards one another and out into the world. In a pace unique to our way of living, dynamic yet serene, this is the Kaohsiung style. In Kaohsiung, farming and fishing is finding a new vitality. We bend over to plow the fields and sow seeds of hope in the nurturing land and deliver the finest delicacies to your dinner table. Perseverance and sincerity. This is the Kaohsiung style. In the past, Kaohsiung toiled without hesitation or complaint. Industrial development inflicted countless wounds, but also inspired the longing for a better environment, deserving a better future. We determine our fate. This is the Kaohsiung style. This city, its every nook and corner, calls for in-depth exploration. Read books, experience life, and appreciate the Kaohsiung style. From old Kaohsiung to new Kaohsiung, each generation has its own Kaohsiung style its own style in its own era. What shapes us into the people of Kaohsiung? It is our memories and our unique Kaohsiung character. Our horizons are as broad as the ocean. With our hands and minds, we are molding our city into a gateway to the world. This is Kaohsiung, and this is the Kaohsiung style. Great. Uh, reminds me I need to get back to Kaohsiung. So <laughs> um, please uh, join me in welcoming the uh, embodiment of Kaohsiung style, uh, Mayor Chun, <laughs> to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. It's an honor to be CSIS today to share Taiwan and Kaohsiung stories of transformation. In the video just played, you all saw that Kaohsiung is a culturally diverse, beautiful port city with very friendly people. So on behalf of Kaohsiung city government, I would like to welcome and invite you all to come for a visit. Kaohsiung was not always the beautiful place it is today, however. She was once the ugly duckling that suffered through a half century of pollution from heavy industry. There's a river that runs through Kaohsiung called the Love River. The former chief of the Kaohsiung branch office of the AIT, Bob Dewitt, used to joke that 30 years ago when he first came to Kaohsiung, the Love River sank so bad that he could always smell it before he saw it. But in 2014, when he finally came back to Kaohsiung to take office, the Love River had already turned into a beautiful tourist attraction. Now, Kaohsiung has a very special place in my heart. It is because Kaohsiung is a sacred site in Taiwan's democracy movement. When I was young, in 1979, the Kaohsiung incident took place there. 
many were arrested for protesting against the authoritarian rule of KMT, and I was one of them. I was also accused of being one of their ring leaders, facing a possible death sentence. I never would have thought that I'd later become the mayor of that same city. Over the past 40 years, Taiwan went through the very dramatic transformation from an authoritarian ruled country into democracy. Kaohsiung as well has seen enormous changes over the past 12 years or 4,000 days. We've put our polluted past behind us. And now we are agree that Kaohsiung has become a very livable city. There was very dramatic change that happened in between. Today, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to come here today to speak with you about Taiwan has transformed during my 40 years in public service and how Kaohsiung has done likewise in my 4,000 days as mayor. In 1968, I was 19 years old and I was a student and worked as an assistant to the provincial legislator, Kuo Yunxin. I helped him with document filing. Mr. Kuo was involved in the democracy movement, although it was still in its infancy then. He was a very important role in that democracy movement. In 1949, the KMT came to Taiwan and immediately declared martial law. They prohibited people from organizing opposition parties. The national legislator had been elected to mainland China and never had to stand for election for decades. Anyone who opposed a government, even if it was just for someone to read a banned book or to make some complaints, ran the risk of getting run into jail for years or being executed. Mr. Kuo was against this one-part dictatorship and long for the freedom and democracy existed in the West. Working for Mr. Kuo, I gradually came to understand Taiwanese politics, and little by little, I got caught up in the maelstrom of history. In 1971, United Nation, Taiwan was excluded from the United Nations, and a sense of crisis arose among the Taiwanese people. They started to worry about the nation's certain future. Re-election of all national legislators became the one specific demand of the democracy movement. The KMT was forced to open up a few legislative seats to popular elections. Since opposition parties were completely illegal, and we cannot become one of the opposition parties, so we call ourselves the Dong Wai, literally meaning outside the KMT. So during the time, every single election provided an opportunity for Dong Wai activities, and our movement gained strong popular support. To provide aid to political prisoners, during the time, with some help from foreign friends, I deliver a list of political prisoners to Amnesty International, and this ended up angering the KMT government. I remember back in 1978, one day out of nowhere, the police suddenly show up and search my apartment. And so I ran to Changhua and hid out at a Catholic church run by Father Ronald Bocheri. But I, they found me within just a few days. Father Bocheri was deported back to the United States. He passed away three years ago. Here, I hope that he would rest in peace. That was the very first time I got arrested during the time. I was told that the US government put pressure on the KMT, so I was released after just 13 days. In the past Immediately, which is the Human Rights Day, Formosa Magazine marked the uh, occasion by organizing a rally in Kaohsiung, and the KMT responded by making mass arrest. This was the very pivotal Kaohsiung incident that changed Taiwan's democracy movement. Over 100 people were arrested, and eight of us were charged with sedition, which is an offense that carried a death sentence. Two of those eight people were women, including Annette Liu and myself. 
uh, Annette Liu, later as we know, had become Taiwan's vice president. I'm often asked about women's public participation in Taiwan. Well, you know, of those eight political prisoners, uh, one fourth of those political prisoners were women. So we're talking about 25% here, so not bad, right? There were a lot of outstanding women in the Danwai movement who are highly respected for their contributions. Some have since taken part in various social movements and others have become national legislators, county magistrates, city mayors, county mayors. Women now account for 38% of all national legislators. So during the uh, Human Rights Day rally in 1979, we were calling for the lifting of the martial law, establishment of democracy, permission to organize opposition parties in Taiwan, and the right to elect our own legislature. But for that, for that, we were charged with sedition. So in the past, politically charged cases were always tried in secrecy or behind closed doors, but the Kaohsiung incident attracted so much international attention that the KMT was forced to carry out the trial in public. And that's why in the court, we, for the sake of ourselves and for democracy, we made the case and the media reported it all almost verbatimly. It, so that ended up being a very good education for democracy in Taiwan, people realized that the so-called traitors were in fact true patriots. They really loved Taiwan, they really understood Taiwan, and because of that, we gained a lot more sympathy and support. But after our arrest, we were held in comunicado and had no idea what was happening outside the prison wall. We were in court, only when we were in court, when we first learned about the family massacre of the Lin family, our fellow defendant, Mr. Lin Yixiong's home, was broken into, and his mother and his seven-year-old twin daughters were murdered, leaving his nine-year-old daughter, Judy, in grave condition, badly hurt. So because of that, because when the news was heard in court, everybody broke down in tears. I knew that participating in democracy movement would come with a price. I just never expected that this price would be so high, so steep, and so cruel. The Lin family was under 24-hour surveillance by the secret police, and the murders still happened. So they're really trying to send this as a message to us all, to warn us, so to speak. Lin Yixiong's mother and daughter uh, and mother and daughters were very close to me, and so this murder s situation scarred me for life. Later on, Judy was brought back to life again, and she was later uh, study. She later studied in California and became a concert pianist. I'm very happy to hear that she's now married and uh, to an American pastor, even though they now reside in Taiwan with five children. So after the murders of the Lin family, the KMT faced even more pressure from the international community, and KMT had to give up on consenting, uh, on sending us the four, eight of us to death. I was given a 12-year sentence. The mass arrest after the culture incident incident were intended to quash the democracy movement, but what happened was that they ended up helping the movement to grow even faster, and therefore, the number of seats won by Deng Wai candidates after that increased rapidly with each successive election. In early 1986, after I was in prison for six and a half years, I was suddenly released, and quickly I joined a secret team that was a team planning and organizing to uh, form an opposition party. And in September of the same year, the DPP party was born. To a surprise, the KMT did not come to arrest us because by that time, the democracy movement had already enjoyed mainstream support. And the KMT was very, uh, they had to take into consideration of our strong public support. And the next year, martial law, which lasted for the longest in the world, was finally lifted. And the dawn of democracy was finally in sight in Taiwan. After the lifting of the martial law, the democracy movement and other social movements developed quite quickly. In late 1992, 
all the seats in the national legislature were put up for re-election, and people finally have a chance to elect their own national legislature. And of course, this is nothing, not a big deal in the United States, right? But in Taiwan, that was a very historic first. Two years later, Mr. Chen Shui Bian was elected the mayor of Taipei, and he invited me to head the Department of Social Welfare. So from an uh, opponent outside the system, suddenly I became a member of the Taiwanese government. Uh, now, a major test of any young democracy isn't about whether a country could hold a free and, and fair election and then produces a winning party. But the key question is whether the ruling party that wins can concede power and pass over power to the to the uh, when it when it loses. That moment of truth for Taiwan came in 2000 when Chen Shui Bian became the Taiwan's president by election, something that we didn't even dare to dream in the past. But now it had come true. At the time, a lot of people were concerned that the KMT had ruled for five decades. Would they refuse to concede power? Would there be actually a possible military coup d'etat? At the time, when after President uh, Chen Shui Bian was elected in 2004, the KMT candidate refused to concede defeat and call on his followers to occupy the square across from the presidential office building for months. Fortunately, however, Taiwan successfully overcame all these challenges. So the change, now how exactly did democracy change Taiwan? Let me give you two examples. During his first term as president of Taiwan, Chen Shui Pian appointed me as a minister for the Ministry of Labor. At the time, we call it the Council of Labor Affairs. And we undertook a series of labor legislation, legislation uh, reform. We cut the 48-hour work week to 42 so that people could take Saturdays off. We also established an employment insurance system so that the employee unemployed workers could receive benefits. We reformed labor pension fund and to ensure that all retired workers would receive pensions. We also passed legislation in the legislative yuan to safeguard gender equality in the workplace. Now, people had talked for a decade or two about these things, doing these things, but they never got them done. Why? Why is it that when the DPP came to power, we made it happen? That's the good thing about democracy, because back in the authoritarian period, the government was high up and mighty and did not pay attention to the voice of the people. But it's on now in a democracy, government has to care about people's well-being, and we do. The second example is the younger generation, about this younger generation of the Taiwanese people. After the handover of power in 2000, the democratic mindset began to take root in the schools or campuses and would later have a huge impact. Um, there was the Sunflower Student Movement in 2014, and participants were mostly born after the lifting of the martial law. They had never, they never lived in the shadow of authoritarianism, and they grew up with very normal education. They identify themselves, regardless of where they came from, whether they are families from the province of Taiwan or ancestors from the mainland, they regarded themselves as Taiwanese, just like the immigrants, the second generation immigrants in the US who identify themselves as Americans. These young people, felt that the KMT economic policy promoted too much reliance on China and was undermining Taiwan's national security. So they stormed the national legislature and occupied for 23 days. What they did, send shock waves, uh, shock waves through the Taiwanese society and even provided inspiration to those young people in Hong Kong who six months later launched their own umbrellas, uh, the Sunflower Movement. The sunflower generation isn't divided by ethnic tensions. They are plain spoken, they are courageous, they are a new breed of a Taiwanese people. They are the ones who will defend Taiwan's freedom and democracy from here on. And the Taiwanese people have great expectations of this younger generation. Now, Chen Sui Pian ruled for eight years, and then the KMT came to power again, and then after another eight years, Chai Ing-wen became the first 
female president of Taiwan. So now that power has changed hands between the KMT and DPP for three times, I think peaceful handover process has become the norm, and I think this is the greatest accomplishment of Taiwan. And along with the transformation in Taiwan, I realized that those of us who had fought for Taiwan's democracy, we also need to change with times. When I was in my 20s, my companions and I were those who were revolutionaries who sought to overthrow a dictatorial regime. The KMT government regarded as a seditious. In fact, there were four women in the Dang Wai, including Annette Lu and I, were labeled by the Thai KMT government as what they call as four women desperados, the four women bandits, so to speak. But that was then. The handover of ruling power in 2000 marked the beginning of a new era in Taiwan. The KMT stepped down, and then it was the DPP's turn to govern the nation. As I went from a revolutionary to a reformer, I discovered that reform is actually more challenging than revolution because we, in the past, were outside the system. And we could do what we wanted with a very passionately and did our opposition work. But now that we are inside the system, we have to be very careful and very prudent with every step of our way to pursue reform. That's why I, when I hated the Council of Labor Affairs, I talk about that. And when I became the mayor of Kaohsiung in 2006, this kind of feeling struck home even more. Kaohsiung is the biggest metropolis in southern Taiwan. The port of Kaohsiung is the 13th busiest container port in the world. Kaohsiung became a city of industry under Japanese rule. After World War II, all refineries, steel mills, and shipyards began popping up, turning Kaohsiung into a center of heavy industry. As mayor, my biggest challenges are to clean up after decades of pollution and to facilitate our industrial transformation. We built a lot of parks. Green belts, wetlands, and the natural. And we also recovered an uh, environment which had suffered years of mistreatment. We cleaned up our rivers, we cleaned up our streams, we cleaned up our waters, which are now clear. The most notable of them is the Lug River. Many areas in Kaohsiung used to flood during the typhoon season, often up to have a story deep. So in Kaohsiung, we have dug out 15 flood detention basins that, when dry, are used as parkland, complete with jogging paths and more. However, when there is a storm, these areas where we built become basins that don't flood anymore. Kaohsiung also has a population of 2.8 million people, and most people they either drive a car or a scooter getting to work. So in Kaohsiung, we do have serious air pollution. Currently, we have two mass transit lines, and we are also in the process of building a light rail loop line, as well as another new rail transit lines. With that network, we're going to have we're going to be able to offer outstanding coverage throughout the city. All of Kaohsiung City's 38 districts have public bus service, and there are 5,000 public rental bicycles. Transportation in Kaohsiung just keeps getting more convenient and cleaner. It's also getting cleaner. The industrial harbor facilities have been entirely moved south to a new harbor, to the second harbor, and there were a lot of abandoned warehouses at the old harbor, so we rebuilt them as spaces for artists to have become museums and shops. And we now call this place Pier 2 Art Center. Kaohsiung is also home to a large number of new immigrants from the Southeast Asia. So to promote diversity, schools now offer language classes to children of the new immigrants so they could learn their parents' mother tongues. So with that, Kaohsiung is gradually moving on 
from its heavy industrial beginnings to become a multifaceted modern metropolis with diverse industries and culture. It's a very modern city now. My team at a city hall is very clear about what we want to accomplish. We want to clean up our polluted environment that we inherited. We want to create a livable city that doesn't fly, and a city with convenient transportation, with a wide variety of jobs, and make it very livable. The transformation of Kaohsiung is still a work in progress, but everybody agrees Kaohsiung is different now. Kaohsiung is much more beautiful today. But today, being here, I want to say that in the past, under the authoritarian rule, I was a revolutionary. I fought to build a society where different voices could be heard. But in democratic times, everything that I do is to become a reformer while in overcoming difficulties. I want to build a city where people and nature can thrive together. Different times call for different types of leaders. Our president, Tsai Ing-wen, she is quite a different person than I am. Three years ago, she also came here to deliver a speech. Our president, Tsai, she is a very steadfast, professional, and rational elite. She is not a politician like me. She's not like a, a desperado kind of personality, which I suppose I am. However, she is every bit as determined as I am about getting reform done. Since taking office, President Tsai has been working toward reform the pension system, which has been a very serious issue. And she's also trying to recover assets that political parties have obtained through illicit means that are very unfair. These reforms are absolutely necessary, but they're also very difficult. Take the case of pension reform, for example. Public sector retirees receive far more generous pensions than blue collar workers. Some of them make their deposit at the bank and receive 18% of interest on their pension deposit, which is very unreasonable. President Tsai's pension reform effort has won most of the uh, support from most of the Taiwanese, but a small number of people still oppose it bitterly. And the com campaign to recover ill-gotten party assets is another case in point. During the authoritarian era, KMT turned a lot of national assets into their pers uh, personal or party assets. And that's, but it also makes the election campaigns very unfair. So the effort to recover these ill-obtained assets has also enjoyed strong populist support. But we have to remove all these unfair systems that we inherited from the authoritarian era so that Taiwan could achieve normalcy. During our transitional period, we also are met with resistance. But I firmly believe that President Tsai, in her own gentle but determined way, will succeed in the end. The same, is, same could be said with cross-trade relations. President Tsai, she steadfastly and tenaciously upholds Taiwan's sovereignty. While at the same time, she demonstrated to China her good faith intention to maintain peaceful ties. She has wanted to reform for our armed forces, emphasize Taiwan's self-defense capabilities, and she hoped to cooperate with US, Japan, and other nations so that together we can maintain regional security in Asia. So being here, as I look back, it seems that in my life, they're having a lot of unex unexpected twists and turns. Because of Kaohsiung incident, I was in prison. I never would have expected that I would later become the mayor of Kaohsiung and to stay in the office for 12 years. In Kaohsiung incident, the entire Dongwai leadership was arrested. However, it did not not only 
distinguish the democracy movement, he ended up galvanizing people into more political actions and finally led to the end of the authoritarian rule in Taiwan and turned Taiwan into a democratic country. When I was younger, I opposed the single party dictatorship. I dreamed that Taiwan could have the same kind of freedom of speech and democracy as it is in the West. However, during the time, I felt that those dreams were as unreachable as the stars in the sky. I did not expect that this dream would one day come true. Now in Taiwan, we have complete freedom of speech. And now we could democratically choose our national legislators and presidents. Our current president is a woman. The mayor of Kaohsiung is a woman and sort of speakers of the Kaohsiung City Council and the Taipei City Council. And in our National Assembly, about 40% of them are also women. So Taiwan is the most free and democratic nation in Asia. Achieving democracy was no easy feat. And to consolidate it is even more difficult. So as we reform, all these very unreasonable systems we inherited from the authoritarian era, we also have to face a lot of external threats, as well as a rapidly changing Asia. Taiwan's democracy is maturing. And the DPP has become a fully-fledged reformist party. I firmly believe that we have the capability to face all the challenges that lie ahead. However, Taiwan needs the support from the international community. I hope that international community could give us a chance. When I was younger, I was arrested twice, and the reason why I was able to stay through them was because of that. And it is also international support that helped Taiwan throw off authoritarianism and achieve freedom and democracy. Today, Taiwan needs international community to give up more space and more support and to pay more attention to us. The democracy, our culture, and our freedom enjoyed in Taiwan are for by the young people and a lot of people in Hong Kong and China and, and other countries of Asia. Taiwanese values are the new Asian values. Taiwan may be small, but we could play a very huge role in Asia as we pursue democracy in Asia. So that maintaining Taiwan's freedom and democracy is important to all of Asia. It's not just in the interest of Taiwan and the US. It's also a shared responsibility. I hope the United States and Taiwan can work closely together and defend peace in the Indo-Pacific region and even throughout the world. We hope for peace and we hope to see more opportunities for cooperation internationally. On behalf of Kaohsiung, I would like to thank CAIS to give me this opportunity to be here. And thank you all very much for coming once again. Thank you again. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to welcome you to CSIS. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director of the China Power Project at uh, CSIS. 
and in 1979, I was studying Chinese in Taipei. Uh, many of the things that I read at the time were underground documents, journals that were published uh, by the Dong Wai. Um, I never imagined that we would have the opportunity to welcome you here at, uh, at CSIS today. Okay, so we'll continue with our, uh, with our discussion, and I very much enjoyed uh, your speech, and uh, thank you, of course, again for hosting my delegation uh, when I visited Kaohsiung uh, last August. Uh, but it's really a, a pleasure to have you here at uh, CSIS, um, and uh, we have uh, looked forward to this event. So before we open up to some of the members of our audience uh, to pose their questions, I'd like to pose uh, a few of my own. One of the things that uh, has been a, uh, ongoing in Taiwan is the implementation of the transitional justice law. And it's very controversial in Taiwan. There are, I think, people uh, on the, uh, in the KMT who believe that this transitional justice law is really revenge uh, for the KMT's white terror period uh, for the 38 long years. Uh, and of course, the uh, transitional justice law has been seen by others as aimed at achieving healing and reconciliation. So could you explain a bit the, uh, the purposes of the transitional justice law and how it will help to strengthen Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel that transitional justice is not for revenge. I, fir I think, first of all, we want to uncover the truth of history. And number two, in the past, there were a lot of injustice. There were a lot of injustice that we want to correct. So transitional justice is the only way to help us reach reconciliation. The democracy and the freedom that we see today compared with the white terror period, that's, you, you can't even compare the two. And we just saw a uh, publication of Freedom House and it said that Taiwan is one of the free countries and even more so than Indonesia, Philippines, Hong Kong, and South Korea, Singapore, and Malaysia. What I'm trying to say here is that Freedom is not a free lunch. Freedom is what we have to fight for. During this process, a lot of people sacrifice their lives. Pause. Many of them lost their families. They had broken families. Many of them, could uh, we could not even find their bodies. And a lot of the truths are still under, uh, are, are still buried we don't know the truth. For example, in Hualien, there is a Dr. Zhang in Hualien. They were killed along with the other members of the family on uh, February the 28th. We call it a 2 to 8 incident. Likewise, in Kaohsiung, Tu Shiwen and his father, who is Tu Guangling. They were very important negotiators for the 228 incident, but after his father had gone up 
uh, to the meeting, attended the meeting for negotiation, and he never came back down, and he was shot to death. And so this Mr. Tu had never seen his father. This is what we call the white terror. The tragedy of 228 was the residual uh, stories of this can be seen everywhere in Taiwan. Lin Maosheng, the first uh, PhD uh, holder that came to the United States, that got his PhD from the United States, he was arrested during the 228 incident. And today, we still don't know his whereabouts. We don't know about the truth of his death. Therefore, through pushing or promoting the uh, transition justice in Taiwan, we're not doing that for the sake of revenge, but we want to seek the truth. We want to know the truth so that we can reconcile. We hope that all those political um, uh, documents can be, uh, during the authoritarian period, uh, those archives can be exposed again and can be open to the world. Only then can Taiwan become united and move forward. So I myself was someone who had been persecuted by an authoritarian government, and I sincerely hope that I sincerely hope that I can c c help carry out the transformation in Taiwan, just like what happens in Germany, so that Taiwan can become a more free. Uh, more democratic and a country with more justice. So I think that promote the promotion of trans transitional justice is not for revenge. It is, again, I would like to say, by promoting that we can come to reconciliation so that we can also achieve unity in, uh, inside the country. I'd like to uh, ask about the development of relations across the Taiwan Strait. And I know that as mayor, you have visited I know as mayor, uh, you have visited uh, China. And of course, you've hosted many. <laughs> no problem. I apologize. As uh, as mayor, you've received many visitors uh, from from China as well. And of course, uh, you know that President Tsai Ing-wen has. Uh, worked hard to preserve stability across the Taiwan Strait. And of course, the United States very much would like to see uh, stability. So going forward, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that stability is preserved? Um, are, you, are you worried about the cross-strait relationship? Do you have your own vision for how relations across the strait uh, can proceed going forward. On the cross-strait relations, of course, it is one of my major concerns because as mayor of Kaohsiung, and even in the past, I always felt that we need to have exchanges between the two sides. We need to continue to communicate. We need to understand each other. We can appreciate our differences. However, in the process of communicating, I said that we need to seek commonality in the midst of our differences. And therefore, I think through exchanges and communications, I think we should be able to have dialogues. However, as far as I can see, up until now, we are still at the place where we our proposals are not accepted by the mainland. I think that's a regret because Beijing is always pointing its finger using lecturing or uh, sanctioning or 
because they do not like the policies of President Chai Ing-wen. But remember that she was, she's one elected by the people. And of course, she represents the mainstream ideas of the Taiwanese people, hoping that through mutual understanding of the two sides across the strait, that we can come closer together. But we cannot just blindly just accept whatever Beijing proposes. And therefore, when she was elected the president of Taiwan, she talked about the three unchanged. Um, she is not an instigator. I think she's seeking for new ways of communicating between the two sides so that we will not feel pressure to accept any kind of proposal thrown at us. And I think we hope that there are more dialogues between the two sides. So currently, what I'm concerned about is that if we don't have exchanges, if we don't have communication, that's not a positive thing. But I think Taiwan will continue to show that we will show our sincerity. Remember, sincerity is a two-way street. Goodwill is a two-way street. And that's why I hope that that we are not looking at the problem in one direction. I am looking forward to better communication and better exchanges. Thank you very much. Let me ask you a question about the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and the attitudes of uh, people in Taiwan, especially where you are in Kaohsiung towards the United States. You know, I remember in 1979, as I arrived in Taipei as a, uh, as a young student, it was three weeks after the U.S. had broken diplomatic ties with Taiwan, um, there were obviously some emotions uh, among the people, uh, but we have, over the past um, almost 40 years, uh, not only, I think, preserved a very close bilateral relationship, but expanded it and nurtured it. Um, and not only in the security sphere and the economic sphere um, and our dip the diplomatic sphere, but especially in people-to-people -people exchanges. But I, I worry about um, the attitudes in, in, of people in Taiwan, whether the people in Taiwan are confident about U.S. support for Taiwan continuing. So as, as China becomes stronger um, and uh, it has more, more clout, uh, do the people of Taiwan worry that U.S. support will weaken? Um, or is there sufficient confidence that the United States will continue to stand up for freedom, democracy, um, and the right of the people of Taiwan to choose their future? This is such an important question, a very big, uh, also, uh, also very sensitive. Bonnie just said it's also very sensitive. The Taiwanese people seek for their own sovereignty. They seek the universal values, which are freedom and democracy. These values are acknowledged and endorsed and supported by all democratic countries, not just the United States. Taiwanese people are working so hard have been working so hard, turning themselves from being a country ruled by authoritarian government to a democracy. However, the questions or the issues faced with Taiwan today is not about the full reliance on the U.S. government. Taiwan also needs to uh, actually put in more efforts in terms of our economy and also the defensive power or the defense powers of our own. Because only when we can have those powers ourselves, we will be able to choose our own way to live and we can have our own values. But the world today is a global village. 
And just by counting on the Taiwanese people to work alone, that is not enough. So even though Taiwan is a tiny place, but if you look at democracy and freedom and the fights that we have engaged in for these values, then you can see that all the experts on the Taiwan issue, on the China issue, would also agree with us that that the Taiwanese people, they have faced generation of and after generation of challenges from authoritarian government and also from uh, the mainland. And therefore, I think that this is today in Taiwan under Chai Ing-wen's administration. They also know that they cannot just count on relying on a country like the U.S. We have expectations that you may support us, but we cannot rely on you. Because as I've said before, we need to have our own national defense power. We need to work through more extensions and dialogues with the rest of the world so that people will understand what Taiwan is about, so that they understand that we may be a small place, but the values that we yearn for are very precious. And I think they need to appreciate that with us. This is such a big question. I may not be able to answer you satisfactorily, however, as I had sought for freedom and democracy for the past four decades. From that experience, I have learned that we have gained a lot of support from the international community, including the human rights organizations, including those in the United States who have given us a lot of support. And in that process, I think they have been playing very important roles. So please don't leave us alone, and we hope that Taiwanese people will work hard together so that we all will be able to uh, gain the support of the war at large. Thank you. Well said, well said. Floor, uh, let me preface this by saying uh, that we will have a, an opportunity for the journalists to meet separately with Mayor Chun immediately following the event. So I would like to ask uh, the non-journalists in the room uh, to use this opportunity to pose their questions, wait for the mic to come to you, identify yourself, and please make your question clear and short. Okay, uh, Motegi-san, the, uh, the microphone is on its way. Thank you very much. My name is Takahiro Motei. I'm a visiting fellow at the CSS Japan Chair. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow here at CSIS. I also learn Chinese in Taiwan, and so I can speak in Chinese. Today, I would like to ask you about the relationship between Taiwan and Japan. What, is, what are your expectations? To Japanese government in order to strengthen the ties with Japan. Thank you. Thank you. The relationship between Taiwan and Japan is very complicated. Because Japan wants to rule Taiwan. However, Taiwanese people are very friendly toward Japanese people. In Japan, during the 311 earthquake, out of all the nations in the world, the one that supported uh, Japan the most financially was actually Taiwan. But of course, nowadays, the relationship between Taiwan and Japan would obviously involve each of their own national interests. So we cannot expect Japan to support Taiwan unconditionally. But we could feel that Japan as a whole, well, let's just say that uh, the uh, Japan Asia, uh, East Asia um, Association actually changed its name 
into a Taiwan Japan Exchange Association. So examples that, that like that really show how much uh, Japan thought of uh, Taiwan. So between Taiwan and Japan, of course, we have some issues regarding fisheries, regarding the Senkaku Island, regarding um, issues related to the sea. But we hope that the Taiwan-Japan relationship through more rational communications, exchanges, and negotiations, we could bring mutual benefits to each other on equal foot. Thank you. Bring the microphone over here, please. Thank you. OK. My name is Wang Shuhui. I was born and raised in Gongshan. On behalf of my family, I would like to thank Mayor for all the efforts that you put in on behalf for the Taiwanese people. Continue fight for our people in Taiwan. And no coaching. It's easy. Just say thank you. Oh. We love you. Keep doing a good job for us. Thank you. Okay. Next, we hope for a question. Yes, woman right here. Good afternoon, um, Mayor. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of an unprofit called Hope for Tomorrow. Looking at your, thank you so much for your leadership and your presentation. Looking at your leadership from going to jail, coming out, leading us, what are the most challenging thing to you? You can tell the whole women in around the world of human rights, women rights, and uh, job creation, just the challenges you face. Thank you so much. So what would you tell the world and women leaders around the world? That's a very big question. First of all, when I was opposing KMT, their authoritarian rule in Taiwanese society, I wasn't doing it just from a female perspective. I was doing it as a person. I was a human being. I was opposing oppression. I was opposing dictatorship. I was opposing living in fear. I did it from a person's point of view. In addition to being a human being, of course, I'm a woman. I'm a female. So today, in the world, from a more traditional point of view, a lot of women have faced limitations and oppression and unfair treatments. But if you look at human history, there have been a lot of people that are also living in fear and oppression. So today, as someone that has been fighting long for, for women for, against oppression and authoritarian, I support all women to be treated equally and with respect. I hope that women will never be oppressed because of their gender. Everyone should enjoy the freedom that they deserve. Thank you. Right there. Uh, thank you for your presentations. My name is Chen Shen Hong. I'm also from Taiwan. I'm a research scholar of Southeast Asia program at the Sinton Center. Chen Jun Nishi, ni hao. My name is called Hong Chen Shen. Now, I want. I would like to ask you about Xinanshan policy. Uh, Kaohsiung is the base of Xinanshan. What do you think? How is Kaohsiung? a great place to do that. And oh, for the new southbound uh, policy for uh, why, what kind of uh, and how can it connect with the Taiwan's new south policy? Thank you very much for this excellent question. Taiwan's industry policy 
includes smart machinery and green energy, as well as biotech and defense industries. There are also new agriculture and circular economy. So I think Kaohsiung is a very important city for industries, for steels, for uh, uh, shipyard. They all locate in Kaohsiung. So Kaohsiung is going through industrial re reform and transformation. And so now we have been focusing more on solar panel and biotech and aerospace technologies, etc. All these will help with the new southbound policy. Um, for example, new agriculture. I believe agriculture in Taiwan would provide great benefits to a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have been enjoying more advancements in both our policies and technologies in agriculture. So in the future, we will be able to provide more assistance to countries in Southeast Asia. We are also very advanced in medicine. I also believe that will make great opportunities for exchange with countries in Southeast Asia. Additionally, Kaohsiung is also a city of immigrants. We have a lot of immigrants from Southeast Asia and a lot of new immigrants and migrant workers are from these countries and a lot of people's spouses are also from these countries. So their second generation immigrants are in schools, in high schools, in college now. We have a very important policy in Kaohsiung that every single child has a right to learn their mother tongue. It doesn't matter if your mother is from Philippines or Thailand or Indonesia or Vietnam. We have a lot of uh, children um, from Vietnamese families. So we want to make sure that these children can learn their mother tongue since they're young. And all that will play important roles in our new Southbound policy. And we are also cultivating new talents. And these talents that we're cultivating understand their mother native culture and they know that we respect their cultures and their languages. So Kaohsiung, as we implement the new Southbound policy, I believe we can bring a lot to the table. And in terms of agriculture and medicine, I know that we can help and provide more assistance to countries in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Thomas Liu and I'm a senior at Langley High School. Uh, uh, I am from Chenzhen, Kaohsiung. Two years ago, when I went back to Taiwan, I actually saw you. I was able, I had the opportunity to, to meet with you. So my question is for you. Um, you have been in office for 12 years, and you have made valuable contributions to environmental protections and etc. However, we're facing a very serious issue of population, and a lot of talents are leaving Kaohsiung as well. So how do we attract more talents within Taiwan, or how do we attract more foreign talents to Kaohsiung to make sure that they can uh, plant roots in Kaohsiung? This is a very important question. In Taiwan, people are having less and less children, and we're facing an aging society. For the Taiwanese government, this is becoming a national security issue. This is something that the government needs to deal with, to look at less and less children in the aging society. I saw a statistics and the trend earlier that in the past 30 years, the population have started moving between the north end and the central part of Taiwan. And Kaohsiung, as a city of heavy industry, if we do not transform our industries, if we continue on with traditional industries, our the agriculture will continue to stay in the south in Kaohsiung area. And that will be difficult to attract new talents because we have a structural issue here. 
So Kaohsiung city government, we see that uh, population is increasing very slowly, and we really recognize the danger and the crisis we're seeing here. So first of all, I hope that a lot of new emerging industries could take root in Kaohsiung. So we ask the Thai administration, when it comes to new industries, we ask her to balance between the north and the south and to pay more attention to the south so we can have the opportunity to have to own new emerging uh, industries that will attract talents. In Kaohsiung, when it comes to fossil fuel technology and circular economy, we want to get rid of our past and to transform our base into a more international technological base. So Chongshan University and Chenggong University in Tainan, through our Kaohsiung Economic Bureau, we have established a mechanism to attract new young talents so that they have the opportunity and space to grow and so that you young professionals are willing to stay in Kaohsiung. Of course, it takes many different parties to make this possible. For example, our national development policy cannot only focus on Xinzhu in the north. We need to make it possible for young people to want to stay in Kaohsiung. We have to have policies that promote that. So we are also talking to the central government with this expectation. Okay, um, over here. Hi, uh, my name is William, and uh, I'm a, I come from a Michigan State University. I'm a, I'm currently a sophomore student, and now I'm an intern in Voice of America. Um, Chen Juizhang, oh, uh, Chen Shizhang, you know how? Hello, Mayor Chen. I'm from Michigan University. I'm currently interning at Voice of America. I was listening to your speech and to learn how you've been fighting for human rights and democracy, and that was very inspiring. I do have a question for you. There are a lot of people in Taiwan that was willing to, to sacrifice themselves for democracy, but in my hometown or in my home country, a lot of people also uh, sacrificed themselves in 1989, June 4th. And during the time, we also have some outstanding people back there. We also have Wang Dan and Wu Kaixi and other people like that. I'm not sure who, who are behind them. But all these movements are very similar to each other and very similar results. They are all ended in oppression. I want to ask you, why is it that there are these are very similar movements, but they end up completely differently. Why? Thank you. It's difficult for me to answer this. It's difficult for me to talk about issue like this. Taiwanese people under the KMT education. KMT was opposition of, of Chinese Communist Party. And Taiwanese people grew up with that kind of anti-communism -com education. But in the past, we have also been colonized by other countries. There are many different countries that rule Taiwan. And later on, KMT ruled Taiwan. In the past, Taiwan also in its relationship with other countries, there have been some good precedents. 
and we have learned a lot. And so a lot of uh, progressive ideas we have also learned from these countries because we want to be like the rest of the world where we can be a progressive and also a free country. And because of that, we were under a lot of persecutions and a lot of repression. Um, that's how we came about. I think that my, our situation is very different from the Tiananmen Square incident uh, uh, in China. So it's hard for me to make a judgment or conclusion on the sufferings of your hometown. But what I can tell you is that the democratic movement in Taiwan did not was not initiated by me, but before me, uh, uh, prior to me, there were generations of people who believed that they wanted to live in a world where there's no repression, there's no fear of leaving, and that freedom and democracy are the fundamentals that people are looking for. And so these are very fundamental values, and generation after generation, we continue to work on this. Finally, we've come to our generation where we're beginning to see that Taiwan is moving away from authoritarianism, and Taiwan now has hope for freedom. And so likewise, I hope that in mainland China, no matter what kind of values you have, freedom or democracy, these are all very precious. And I hope that they can all see that they are precious. And I hope that these are the values that can be shared by all the other people in the world as well. And I, I hope that those people in the world who seek for the uh, justice and equality in human society, that whoever are fighting for these values, any country who is working for, on this, we give you our blessings. Thank you. This afternoon, we have had a very, very, uh, it was an, a precious opportunity for you to have listened to you about your experience, about your history. Thank you so much. We, we are very appreciative of our good friends at CSIS and uh, very thankful to all the people who are here on behalf of my hometown, on behalf of my country, Taiwan to tell you that Taiwan's democracy did not grow on trees or did not come to drop from the sky. It was the result of the many hard works and uh, sacrifices of the people in Taiwan. And I hope that Taiwan will be given more space and more opportunities to continue to work on this. And I thank you for your concerns and the support of Taiwan. And on behalf of the municipality of Taiwan, with about 2.8 million people, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to CSIS to give us, to give me as well as Taiwan the opportunity for us to uh, express ourselves. Thank you so much. And she says that in Taiwanese. Thank you. Thank you again.